So in a video last week, Jack mentioned that we were considering a video on the housing crisis and you guys spoke, demanding the video. So here we are. If you want your say going forward, then submit your video topic ideas by clicking the link in the description. We're going to split this video into three parts. First, we're going to explain the housing crisis and why it is in fact a crisis. Second, we're going to explain how we got here and talk about some of the causes. And third, we're going to ask you what solutions you think there are. A quick maths refresher before we start. Let's discuss what median means, because it's used a lot here. Essentially, the median refers to the middle value in a data set. For example, take a look at this list of house prices. The median value here would be £300,000 because it's just the middle value. Anyway, maths lessons aside, let's get into it. So, what exactly is the housing crisis? Well, when people talk about the UK's housing crisis, they're usually referring to the increased cost of housing in the UK. Historically, the ratio between the median house price and the median income has sat around four, which means the median house used to cost about four times the median annual salary. For example, according to ONS data, in 2002 the median house price in England and Wales was £104 and the median salary was £20,596. This means that the median house was about five times as expensive as the median salary. In 2020, however, the median house in England and Wales costs £243,000 and the median income is just £31,580, meaning that the median house now costs nearly eight times the median income. This rises to about 12.5 in London, where the median income is about £38,592, but the median house costs £483,000. Anyway, you get the point. Housing, relative to income, has become a lot more expensive over the years. This isn't the whole story though. Price appreciation isn't a bad thing in itself. Sometimes it can be good for things to get more expensive. Last year, the price of second-hand cars jumped by about 60% in the US. No one thought this was a crisis, it just meant that people badly wanted used cars and people could therefore get more money for their used cars. House price appreciation is different though, for two reasons. It's politically toxic and it exacerbates inequality. It's politically toxic because the housing divide cuts across demographic lines. The housing crisis essentially benefits older homeowners at the expense of younger renters. In 1991, 25 to 34-year-olds and 65 to 74-year-olds were about equally likely to own their own homes. As of 2016, only 38% of 25 to 34-year-olds own their own home, compared to 78% of 65 to 74-year-olds. This isn't because young adults today prefer the flexibility of renting, as is sometimes suggested. In fact, 71% of renters aspire to home ownership in the next decade, most likely because they rightly consider home ownership a great investment. To illustrate quite how good an investment a house can be, consider the fact that it's not unusual for a home today to earn more than its owner. In 2015, for example, the average home in the southeast increased in value by £29,000, while the average annual pay in the region was just £24,542. Unaffordable housing exacerbates inequality in three ways. First, and most obviously, houses are only available to those people who already have enough money to put down a deposit. Essentially, this means that houses are a great investment only available to the already wealthy. Second, unaffordable housing entrenches intergenerational inequality by restricting home ownership to those with wealthy parents. Today, over a half of all first-time buyers under 35 rely on the bank of mum and dad, and this fraction is expected to rise. Third, high house prices make housing most unaffordable for those on lower incomes, even though they buy cheaper houses. In London, for example, the median house is 8.3 times the median household income. The 25th percentile house is 10.3 times the 25th percentile household income, and the 10th percentile house is a staggering 15.5 times the 10th percentile household income. In areas with lower median multiples, this difference is less pronounced. Liverpool, for example, has a median multiple of 3.7, a 25th percentile multiple of 3.8, and a 10th percentile multiple of 5. That means that relative to income, the poorest people in London have to pay nearly twice as much in housing costs as the median resident, 
whereas the poorest in Liverpool only have to pay 35% more. Essentially, when housing is expensive, it's most expensive for the poor, which means they get even poorer in relative terms. So that's why the housing crisis is indeed a crisis. How did we get here though? Well, fundamentally, because the UK simply hasn't built enough houses. According to a 2017 government white paper, the UK needs 225,000 to 275,000 new houses annually, but since the 1970s has only averaged 160,000. UK house building also looks lacklustre by international standards. From 1980 to 2004, the UK housing stock grew by 2.4%, while the French housing stock grew by 3.2% and the German stock grew by 3.7%, according to data from the European Mortgage Federation. So why hasn't the UK built enough houses? Well, there are probably three reasons. The Green Belt, the UK's case-by-case -case planning system, and the collapse of social housing. Let's start with the first one, the Green Belt. Green Belts are areas of protected land that surround cities in which housing development is prohibited. Unsurprisingly, green belts make housing more expensive because they restrict the supply of housing. It's no coincidence that the countries which have all seen the steepest increase in house prices – Canada, Australia, New Zealand and the UK – all use some form of green belt. About 13% of the UK's total landmass, or about 1.6 million hectares, is green belt, more than double the 5% or so that's covered by urban development. Politicians and voters get very defensive about green belts because they imagine them as leafy, eco-friendly areas that prevent cities like London from becoming infinite, sprawling metropolises, but this isn't really true. As well as restricting house building, green belts aren't particularly, well, green. 35% of green belt land is used for intensive arable farming, which has a net negative effect on the environment, according to the 2011 UK National Ecosystem Assessment. They also mean longer commutes with more pollution. 2011 census data suggests that people are commuting further than ever before, with the average distance increasing from 8.3 miles in 2001 to 9.32 miles in 2011. So on to planning. The UK uses a case-by-case -case planning system. Essentially, what this means is that if you want to develop land, you have to send off an application to your local planning authority, who then decide whether to approve it or not. This means that the local planning authority has to look through thousands of individual applications and decide on a case-by-case -case basis. This is unlike other countries which mostly use a zonal planning system, where you can develop in some zones and not in others. The case-by-case -case system slows down development, restricting the supply of housing and also makes it riskier for developers. Essentially, if you're a developer and you buy some land you're hoping to develop on, you don't know if you're actually going to be allowed to do it, unlike in a zonal system. This is fine if you've got loads of money. You can either wait and then reapply, or just buy loads of plots and hope that some of them get approval. But it makes things difficult for smaller developers who need the cash flow. That's why, from 2008 to 2015, volume builder market share nearly doubled from 31% to 59%. At about the same time, profits from the big five firms quintupled from £372 million in 2010 to £2 billion in 2015, and dividends to shareholders increased from 6% of profits to 43% of profits. Essentially, when the housing market is run by just a few big firms, we all end up paying more than we should for houses, and they make ridiculous profits. The last reason is the collapse in social housing. From the end of World War II until the late 1970s, the government used to build about 100,000 social housing units each year for people who couldn't otherwise afford housing. Since then, it's dropped to, well, about zero. This is for a couple of reasons. First, right to buy. Right to buy was a policy introduced by Thatcher in the 1980 Housing Act. Basically, it meant that social housing tenants could buy their houses at a discount. We don't want to get into a massive debate about whether right to buy is a good or bad thing. All you need to know is that it massively reduced the total social housing stock in the UK, from 6.5 million units in 1979 to roughly 2 million units in 2017. Second, there's not enough money. The government spends less than it used to on supplying social housing, instead preferring to spend it on demand-side benefits, such as help to buy, and social housing development is more expensive than it used to be, because a. Land prices have gone up, 
and B, the state has less power than it used to to buy land for cheap off of developers. That's a whole other topic in itself, but essentially the state used to be able to buy land at what's known as existing use value, which is basically what the price would be without planning permission, and could even use compulsory purchase orders, or CPOs, which basically let the state take land off developers for whatever the state deemed a fair price. While they might sound a bit totalitarian to your free market sensibilities, it's worth saying that CPOs are used in both Germany and the Netherlands. So that's the housing crisis in a nutshell. Anyway, if you found this video interesting, the writer that pressured Jack into making this video also wants to do one on some possible solutions to the crisis. So if you'd like that, then leave a comment down below. And also comment below what solutions you think the government should go for, and if you're outside the UK, how your country has managed similar issues. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified every time we release a video. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible.